to record this week. It's a January uh, conference call, and you should have received the agenda yesterday, just the changes on it, uh, some HR updates, and we got a lot on time to get you updated on, and some W-2 and tax information from payroll. So, um, both of you are hiring your new administration, and we ask that you just don't wait till the last minute during payroll to get these in. Uh, it's going to cause so much stress on yourself and us here if there's any issues. So please, uh, I know you are trying to get all the information and get these folks in so they can get paid correctly. Um, I want to remind you about the Secretary and Council of State employees that the salary wage type you should be using on them is uh, 1012. Uh, and the reason for this is to make sure that they go into the correct GL account. Um, as change, we're still waiting on OSP is supposed to be working on whether these folks should earn leave. So when um, they get a uh, ruling or understanding of that process, we will, um, of course, that with you if you don't get it from them and, and make sure the system is set up accordingly. The update. On the HR side, we are going to start a project after the January payroll to look at all our EPA employees out there and get their longevity uh, view if they're eligible or not eligible. We currently, you know, we keep a list of uh, employees that are eligible or not eligible from you all, and we're going to update them once January gets done and you get all these new people into the system. I'll you again of our ticket process here. I've tried in the last two or three months to be nice and, and explain um, what we've done to make it more efficient for you and us. And so that hasn't gone very well. And so we're going to start sending tickets or uh, any ticket requests back to you. Um, we don't need an re uh, email requesting a ticket to be established without the supporting documents. Uh, you know, we get emails that say, please give me a ticket number so I can send you a um, ID card or a name change or something like that. Just give, get all your support documents together and, and submit the ticket to us. It just causes too much extra work because it does, the documents usually don't marry up with the forms. So we want one, tip, one document per fax, one employee per fax employee or one issue per, per ticket if you're emailing it to us. Our mission is that this new ticket system we have is can be automated. So as soon as you send that in, we can automatically create the ticket and we have less people touching the ticket and the ticket and information will get quicker to the people that are going to fix the issue. So please um, help us with that again. Um, we will make an email to tell you to resubmit the ticket or request in, so um, if you get that, please understand we're just trying to be more efficient here. Uh, to remind about NC Flex annual enrollment, you know, as your uh, monthly employee look at their paychecks this month, they're going to realize they screwed something up, and so um, OSP, or messed something up, I guess, proper way, messed up, so OSP will, <laughs> OSP has given us um, guidance and that we, could, we can go ahead and Fix flexible spending accounts without approval. So these are employees that may have put a monthly dollar amount instead of their annual amount in the enrollment. Uh, so if you any of those, just submit us a ticket and we'll fix those. Um, their issues, they forgot to enroll in dental or they forgot to enroll in their flexible spending account, uh, needs to go to OSP first. So send it to OSP for their approval. And once you have their approval, um, submit it, and we'll make necessary corrections or help you with that. And I think in November we were working on some reports here that we want to help monitor and help you um, make sure the data in the system is accurate. And I told you we were going to start them at the beginning of the year. And here's some reports we're starting to do this month. 
Um, our first one I call turn employees in an active position. So as here is when you go and terminate the employee, occasionally uh, you're doing something or a security issue where you're not delimiting them out of the position they're being held in. So we're trying to identify these people and either fixing them for you or contacting you to get them fixed. The report we're running is retirement actions, not on the first of the month. Occasionally and more often than you more often than I think should happen, you are re separating person with a retirement action and the effective date of the retirement action is not the first of the month. Um, you're doing this because you're in the PCR using the wrong date. All retirement actions have to be effective on the first of the month. When you don't do that, you're either you're going to get picked or day. You know, what we see, you're making the PCR effective uh, uh, February 1st, and then when the action happens, it gets a February 2nd date, and they get paid the extra date. Or you're forgetting there's 31 days in January, and you're separating them on January 3rd. And the separation action then is effective January 31st, and not getting a paid for a day. So, so um, we're monitoring that and, and and contacting you to help fix that. Third, report we're looking at is salaries not rounded to the whole number. According to the policy, all salaries should be whole numbers. This is when you hire somebody with 50 cents or 20 cents or something like that, and we'll contact you to get it corrected. The report we're looking at is unemployment records, um, info type 207, not, not with the correct agency. So what we're doing here is that you're not saving the info type 207 when it pops up into the higher action or the re usually the reinstatement action. So this is somebody that may have worked for an uh, agency like HHS, for example, and um, you know, CP hires the person, and when the input type uh, 207 pops up, you're saving it and you're carrying on. And what happens here is just the uh, Employment Security Commission doesn't get the correct information on this employee. So this is quite often, and, and um, we, you know, we average about 20 to 20 or 30. Sorry. Input type 209, not 207. We'll be um, correcting this and getting with you to correct it. Another part we're going to do is uh, FML actions greater than 90 days. Um, you know, typically most employees can only be on FMLA for 12 weeks. And um, um, we're going to just send this information to you to ask you to change the action. What happens on these? Is you know, then continue to get their free health insurance from you and continue to get other, you know, bits from you that they shouldn't be getting that they should on a different action. Um, you know, when we read recently, there's people back in August of, you know, in July and May of last year still on an FMLA action. Report we've been running. And continue is uh, info type 27. This cost distribution record, active um, uh, active cost distribution record on an active employee. Uh, as when you separate somebody, and um, a new a info type 27 is created in case you have any payouts after it's separated, it goes to the correct cost distribution record. Um, when you rehire the person and you save the info type 2, it's supposed to submit the cost distribution record. And if it doesn't or you don't save info type 2, which is mostly the case, that info type stays active. And instead of the money coming from DHHS, it's going to wherever the old agency was. And the old agency is paying for this person. We're trying to um, sure that and correct those as needed. What we're running in-house is uh, PA, what we call PAOM position, position mismatch. Uh, this is when you may transfer a person from one position to another position, or you separate a person. 
Uh, usually it's a transfer where you're transferring from one position to another position. The upside doesn't transfer the position, and they're still a holder in the old position. Um, it's sometimes caused by security issues, that, and sometimes caused just not doing the action correctly. So um, we're catching those and, and um, fixing And they're doing is a POM PCR clean. Up. That's supposed to say Prius quarter. I did not finish my sentence. Um, so we look at the previous qu quarter and look at any outstanding PCRs, OM, uh, or OM PCRs that are out there, and we either complete them, contact you, and cancel them, or whatever the case might be. Um, we're looking at any PCRs that are older than October 1st. Um, and seeing if we can get rid of them. Any questions about these reports? I'm sure we'll add some more to them um, um, as we see where we can help monitor and help keep the data accurate in the system. All right. We're going to run to a bunch of time information we have for you. Randy? Okay, good. Uh, this is Randy Hill. I'm going to be introducing three time quotas that were in production last Friday. <clears throat> Callback comp, comp, quota three, emergency closing comp, quota 27, and incentive leave, which is quota 29. I want to point out that these are new quotas, but the policies haven't changed. Uh, there are new quotas for existing policies. So the first look at it is uh, quota 23, callback comp. Uh, the provisions for this are covered in the on-call and emergency callback pay policy. Uh, in the past, employees have been paid immediately for the hours between the recorded hours and minimum compensation hours, which we refer to as imputed hours. Um, but there's a position setting that can be set effective 1-1-13 for hours to go to comp rather than to be paid out. And this is uh, can be seen on InfoType 9012. Uh, for this, all the existing 9012 records were converted to immediate payout since this has been the behavior since go live. Um, but, uh, a sample of the new position setting looks like. It's very similar to all the other position settings that have comp A limit. Um, option on it. Balances are aged for the limit specified and are paid out upon expiration if they're not used, and accrued balances are payable upon separation. Uh, the second quota we want to introduce is emergency closing comp. This is uh, covered in the last section of the adverse weather and emergency closing <laughs> policy. Quota 7 is valid from January 1st, 2013 forward. Uh, but what happens now that if you key work hours using uh, attendance absence code 9514, which during emergency closing, this is going to generate an hour for hour comp time that will go into quota 27. It's uh, aged for a year, but they're not payable. So if, if they're not used in the hierarchy, then they will expire. The third quota is incentive leave quota 29. This is a policy that was effective January 1st of 2011. Uh, it was granted to eligible new hires <coughs> by way of an infotype 2013 entry. Um, there is a separate quota for this. So if you've granted an employee incentive leave in the past and you've been tracking it offline because the data wasn't available until now, please write a ticket with best or give us a call. We can let you know how the best way to update the employee's record. Um, for quotas 23 and 27, these are controlled by aging records, so there will be a 9901 record associated with these. The site for callback comp is 6025, and the site for emergency comp is 6030. 
three of these quotas, if they are applicable to the employee, they will be shown on their time statement. All of these are included in the adverse weather recovery. If you use a 2012 VA to recover adverse weather, then it will go through the hierarchy and these quotas accordingly if they fall in line. And all of these are included in the approved leave hierarchy quota or the for using quotas. This is what the new hierarchy looks like. Um, you see the three that are highlighted there are the new quotas and where they fall into the hierarchy. But we're still in the process of updating the existing training materials to reflect the new quotas and the revised approved leave hierarchy. So there will be some additional job aids coming out related to the hockey. And information is available through the job aids, a lot more details available. I know a lot of this a lot of you may be seeing this for the first time. This was just this production last Friday. The job aids were posted to the last Friday but you see those, uh, there are links to each of those. Uh, they are under the time section, time management section of the job updates. Um, and we just you to just review these, and if you have any follow-up questions, to submit a, submit a ticket or give best a call to try to get those questions answered. Questions on any of these quotas, or um, I really would like for you to review the job updates and come up with things after that if you haven't had a chance to do so. Also, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, is there an attendance type leave code for incentive leave? No, there's not. Just yes. a normal non thousand. Right. Usually, like all the rest of them. Okay. Um, Randy, what did, um, if an agency wants? So we set everybody that has callback comp. We set it to be, you know, immediate payout because that's why it's been happening. But if an agency has positions they want to change over to, um, you know, say, about in, you know, 365 days, What what's their best course of action? Should they call us to get help with that? Yeah, should probably take us and see what, how much work they have, and we'll help them to decide what's the best method of doing that. Okay. There are also two new BI reports that are available. Um, um, go 215 is the FMLA overview, and you can see the role there as to who has access to this report. Pro provides information about the total amount of FMLA leave, when elig eligibility begins and ends, the number of hours used, and the number of hours remaining. Agents will be able to monitor FMLA events and track the hours associated with the event. And also, the 217 is comp aging with estimated payout costs. Okay. Um, this slide to, to show the correct role for that. Um, but this reports remaining comp time balances with estimated payout costs for subject employees. The estimated cost is based on the employee's estimated FTE hourly rate. It'll be located on the BI time tab, uh, but in, you know until you request access for these reports, you see them on your on your list of options. And to do this, you use the normal procedure routed through your agency's data on her. And we're, um, with the new quotas that have been added, we're still in the process of updating the BI reports to reflect these new quotas. Okay. Um, just want to remind everybody about special leave. Um, we're now <laughs> over right through the year when special leave is eligible, which was, which was made. Uh, July 1st of 2012 through June 30th of this year. 
Uh, so just you know, reminder that that code 9711 will not work after June 30th. So a lot of people across the state that have not used 9711 or have some type of balance left, and I'd encourage you to use out to determine who has the remaining balance. You can use the T3 uh, TSLR, which shows remaining balance. You, you know, you need to advise your employees to use this before it um, So I'd like for you to use PT by Cat's DA to help prevent errors uh, that show up on the PTRL report daily. This morning we sent out 375 errors to the field, and 331 of those were special release. So there's still quite a of, uh, misuse of code, and it um, needs to be monitored a lot more closely than it has been. Um, we'll be glad to help you with that if you have any questions on some to do that. But uh, remind you to review the debate for Special League, which has all this information about how to use CAT DA and PT BAL to ensure the usage and how to errors from occurring. Right. And the last thing that I have is I want to advise you about some adverse weather that's expiring in January and February. There's not a whole lot in January. There are only nine employees actually affected. But in February, there's 189. So, And I know this is, this is six weeks away from it ex expiring. But our next conference call is on the third Tuesday of February, which is the 19th. That's also payroll initialization. So that night, time of hour will run through the end of the month, and all this will appear on 220 if these aren't taken care of. So I want to be proactive in getting with your employees to uh, make up their time or either agree to how they're going to make it up with the 2012 ZAWA. This is our report B0210, adverse liability report to see who has liabilities expiring. And I encourage them to make up their time before control rolls around. Thank you for Randy. And this is Teresa. Uh, we had a lot of excitement in our last call talking about federal taxes and uh, we had a lot of excitement for the last uh, week of the month in, Jan in uh, December and also the first week in January, uh, checking on the news, trying to figure out what the feds were going to do. So let me, let's talk about what happened. So after the last, last conference call where we were concerned about, you know, we didn't know what the rates were going to be because I hadn't made a decision yet. Now, IRS had not put out any information. A couple of days after our conference call, we did get advice that we could continue to use the 2012 rates because, you know, we were worried about our next, our first biweekly payroll, which was due on the 4th. So I sent out, uh, or Ray sent out an email for me that had that information. So in our first biweekly payroll, the one that paid on January the 4th, for federal income tax withholding, we still use the 2012 uh, rate structure, 2012 allowances, you know, it was, it was still the old 2012. And the one thing, um, so then on January the 2nd, I think it was, or 3rd, of course this was after our payroll was already done, uh, the feds passed a law changed and we got an update from the IRS about what to do for 2013. So uh, basically, it was pretty much the same as what was the old 2012 rates. They did add one additional high rate, and so I did that here. Um, so the old rate stayed the same. They added the additional rate of 39.6%. That only impacts wages that are greater than $400,000 annually. Don't really think we're going to have to worry about that too much uh, with um, our employee population. Another thing, though, that did change slightly when well, they made some uh, adjustments adjustments to the brackets that each of those rates apply to and also to the value of your holding allowances. So you know how you turn in your W-4 and you say, you know, I want to be taxed at the married you know, rates with two allowances. Well, each of those allowances has a value and they increase that value just a little bit. Um, just for an example, for biweekly, the old allowance each was worth uh, $146.50 and now it's worth $150. So it's just a few dollars difference. But what that meant was that 
for our first biweekly payroll, we actually did tax people, do withholding taxes on a slightly higher amount of taxable income than we otherwise would have because of these changes in the withholding allowance. So because of that, we wanted to be sure that everybody got uh, full advantage of the tax changes. In this biweekly payroll, payroll two, which pays on Friday the 18th, we retroed everyone back in the biweekly payroll back to January to that first payroll, back to that January 4th payroll, so that they would get advantage of the fact that the balance has decreased slightly, increased slightly, which would have decreased their taxable income. And so everybody will see a, a little bit of a change. Now, it's not a lot of a change because you think about it, you know, the allowance for one biweekly person, you know, it was like $3 <coughs> And if you're at the 10% rate, that's like 33 and a half cents. So it's it's really um, it's very small, you know, from some pennies up to a few dollars. But people may notice that their for this bodily payroll, their federal tax withheld the current tax is maybe a few pennies to a few dollars less than it was this last month, and that's because we did this retro. Um, now for monthly payroll, since we haven't started monthly yet. Uh, monthly will be at the you know the new rate, just like the feds uh, have for 2013, and uh, we will for anybody. We did have a few monthly people that got a uh, off cycle check with a January date, so those people will be retroed back, so it picks up everything since the beginning of January. Now, um, the, those of you that have contacted me uh, directly to asking about the, the tax rates and things like that, you know, normally what we do is we send everybody to the IRS Publication 15, and that's the employer's uh, tax bulletin that has all the rate schedules, et cetera, in it. The IRS still has not updated the uh, Publication 15. So if you pull that up, it still shows the 2012 information. It still says, you know, applicable for 2012, um, at least as of last night. They still hadn't updated uh, for 2013. But they did put out a separate notice and so I did give you the link to that notice. So for those of you that are uh, so inclined and want to read the actual IRS information, that's the notice you can go to uh, until such time that Publication 15 is actually updated for the 2013 tax year. So let me go to the next slide. Now, as I talked about last month, and this didn't change, but I just want to reiterate it because it's fixing it, and it, so it's already hit the biweekly people, but it's fixing to hit monthly, and I just want to make sure everybody is aware. So the FICA tax rate did go up from 4.2% to 6.2%, okay? And we did that in that first biweekly payroll. So the biweekly people saw that um, increase in their FICA taxes already. Monthly, we'll see this for the first time at the end of the month. And it's a big change. I mean, 2% is a, is a big deal for a lot of people. Um, not only did the rate increase to, to be more, so we're taking more taxes out for FICA, the annual limit, so we're going to tax up to now $113,700. That's a couple of thousand dollars higher than the limit was last year. So, you know, some of your higher income people will have, like I said, not only the rate increases, but more of their income will be subject to FICA over the year. Um, the second thing, the Medi-Tax rate stayed the same. It's still 1.45%. But because in the Affordable Care Act, though, they added a new uh, Medicaid tax, again, this is only, it's an, an additional tax that's only going to be paid by the employee, and we only, and it's a 0.9%, but we only withhold it for any wages paid in excess of $200,000. Again, for most of our employees, this will not be an issue, and even for the ones that will have this, they won't hit this until later on in the year anyway, and by then they'll probably forget. So try to remember this. This could hit some people later on in the year, especially some of your new um, um, new administration people. And um, last thing, again, I, I keep reminding people of this, I'm uh, talking about exempt. So if you claimed exempt in 2012 for your income tax, you know, you have to, the employees, that's only good until February 15th of the next year, employees need to put in a new W-4 if they want to claim exempt again or if they want to claim something else, you know, uh, uh, whatever else, uh, ever else they want to do. Um, if they don't do anything, we will, in, and this will primarily hit the, uh, um, I think the weekly will be okay. It's the next monthly uh, in February that usually I think is the first time we really hit this, where people don't send us a form in. It will automatically be switched to single rate with zero allowances, which is like the highest tax rate there is. So we are continuing to try to contact people that haven't sent us forms. Um, 
in um, or, or we haven't seen where they've sent you one there in, in HR and you haven't entered anything recently either. So we, we will uh, keep pushing on this until, again, mid-February to make sure that nobody gets surprised by that. All right, that's all for federal taxes. Anybody have any questions about federal taxes? One I will mention, we do have um, stamps on the check stubs. I know a lot of people don't read those, but if somebody does, we do have uh, a statement on the check stub for the biweekly that talks about, you know, the change in the rates and how their pay is retro back to the January 4th pay. Um, and then for monthly, we, we don't have to worry about the retro part, but our, you know, do have the information about the fire tax going up and and how the new 2013 rate schedule is in effect. So that information will be on the check. Um, and, I, you know, so you may get a few calls about that, but you've got the information here, and also there's statements on the pay stubs. All right, W-2. So it's W-2 time. Um, we're running W-2 this week. At the end of this week, so for address changes, you got anybody whose address is wrong and needs to have their address corrected before W-2s are run, you got to get it in by Thursday. We're going to start in and create the W-2 file Thursday night. Um, so if we don't have it in, if it's not in here by, you know, in the system by 5 o'clock on Thursday, their W-2 is going to be proud to whatever address was on file at that point. Uh, at best, we will actually be physically printing, folding, sealing, getting ready to mail all the W-2s over the MLK weekend. And we'll send, and then the um, mail service center will come pick them up from us uh, Tuesday to start mailing them out. And hopefully, you know, and so everybody should have their, their copy that we mail out for them by the end of the month. We will make the W-2 available to view and reprint. You know, it comes out as a duplicate print. We're going to have that available in through ESS starting on Monday the 28th. Um, so you know, somebody can use that if they don't get their, their uh, paper one in the mail or if they want to see it before they get the paper one in the mail. And we'll start taking requests uh, like we usually do uh, after, you know, after the end of the month. By then, we figure, you know, everybody should have them. And if you ha didn't have them by the end of the month, it probably lost in the mail or, you know, it's being returned back to us because we have that address. And we'll start, you know, people will start calling in here and we'll start doing reprints directly here uh, for people that didn't get them. But again, remind your people they will have access. Everybody who's got ESS can see them in ESS starting on the 28th. And one more thing to remind you of, um, so this is the new piece, and I talked about this last month too, the new piece that's on that W-2 that nobody's ever seen before is this in Box 12. Uh, all your permanent people are going to have this Box 12 code DD. Okay, so even if they have any other deductions that normally show up under Box 12, if they had, uh, if they had the health plan, they're going to see this now, even if they don't have anything else. So. Um, we, we don't know if we'll get a lot of questions about this. We've put some new information, or we'll have some new information about this in the Frequently Asked Questions Guide that goes along with the W-2s that you can access that kind of tells you, you know, field by field where this number is coming from. The new piece is, is, uh, is part of the, again, part of the Affordable Care Act says that we have to give people for information, and it is just for their information only. It's not taxable uh, or anything like that, but for their information, what is the value of their employer-sponsored health care? And the definition of employer-sponsored health care is probably not what you think it is, so I want to be sure you knew what this was here. Um, is based on, again, this is based on the IRS rules, and this, this was determined here at the state uh, by the flexible benefit plan and the state health plan people. It is the employee and employer premiums for the state health plan the NC Flex Critical Illness Plan and the NC Flex Cancer Plan. Okay, so um, because it's the employee and employer cost, it doesn't tie to anything that's on your pay stub, right? Because you don't have employer cost on your pay stub. Uh, but for your information, um, you know the monthly cost for the state health plan on the employer side was four hundred ten dollars and ninety four cents January, you know March, April, May. And then it moved to $432.66 from June through December. Um, it gives you about $5,083.32 annually. So if someone just had the 70-30 plan, employee only, and didn't have the cancer plan or the critical illness plan, and they were an employee for the entire year, they have $5,083.32 sitting in that box 
12 uh, D-Day uh, category. Again, you know, people have all different, you know, they could be here for part of the year. They could have uh, different levels of coverage, uh, you know, family, you know, high-low, uh, child-only. So we may see it could vary greatly from employee to employee. And, again, just if people ask you about it, just remind them it's just for their information. It is not taxable. It's just a new requirement, and we don't know what's going to happen with this down the road with the Affordable Care Act, but we have to put on starting this year. And that's my W-2 update. So, again, we'll be running W-2s this weekend. Great. Do you have any questions? Uh, agencies that have a lot of people out in the field where a lot of your HR or payroll work is maybe done out in the field or even time, please be sure that those people get this uh, presentation or access to this information. Um, it is, um, it will really help help cut down the questions that come into here if, if all the people out there get it. And we're going to post these. We are posting them to our website. Um, remember to record it. So. Uh, the slide presentations out there, too. Any questions in the room? I miss anything? Anything wrong? Probably. <laughs> All right. All right. Me is uh, the, the 19th of February. We have a hold on question. Box 12 does not include any agency specific benefits. Yeah, assuming you're talking about in box 12, anything. By, I mean, box 12 code DD does not have any agency specific benefits. And as far as I know, I don't think there are any agency specific benefits in the in box 12 because um, every, because all of those are after tax. So I don't believe anything in there. But um, you could job aid that goes with W2, and it'll tell you all the codes that are available for box 12 but I don't believe any of the agency right. specific benefits are there because they're not they're not taxed right. all right thank you guys have a great uh, rest of the week and we'll see you next month